I constantly feel an urgency to do things now while I still have the ability. And also, just to do something huge. I, I don't want to sit around in my life and, and wait for it to pass me by. I, I have an urgency to go out there and grab what I can. And this is one of those opportunities to grab this huge epic journey for myself and for many other people. I used the epic. You, <laughs> I stole that from Mike. That's awesome. Do you, uh, have you found yourself at all yet dreaming about the finish line? There have been days that I've just said, Kyle, stop. His motto that makes me crazy is, it's not supposed to be easy. And that makes me crazy because he's my son and I want something in his life to be easy for him. So far I haven't found it, but you know, some of it's his own doing. <laughs> we had one of those brother relationships that was the, I'm gonna punch you in the face kind of relationships. I got a scar on my head from him throwing a, a Game Boy game and hitting me right in the forehead. He, he's, he's got a strong will to him. I just wish he could still have a meaningful life and do things that mean a lot to him. It never really hit me how serious it was. It didn't matter who told me what was going to happen to Kyle. Um. <laughs> Stupid. Yep. All right, here we go. We're gonna try and catch some speed here. Uh, it's the last run of the day, but we're not supposed to say that because that usually means you get hurt. But uh, anyway, let's have some fun. In the t time leading up to um, when he was actually diagnosed, probably several years prior to that, I was, I'd was i always been his uh, baseball coach, little league coach. He was a pitcher then, and, uh, and he actually was a very good baseball player. And I started noticing that he was missing ground balls, he couldn't get the ball over the plate, and, um, and he also had a little bit of a, like a tremor. Scared today. Right down. I am okay. A hundred times the doctors say. I am okay. I am okay. They finally did the genetic tests where they, you know, took some of his blood, sent it to a lab. And, uh, and at that point, although we didn't know it, he had suspicions that, that it was Friedrich's ataxia. And uh, when it came back, he called us into the office and basically just told us um, 
what the diagnosis was and you know we asked a lot of questions and he really didn't give us any help he kind of gave us a web page and said you know see you later so uh, so it was it was pretty devastating of course I started looking on uh, on the internet to see exactly what we were dealing with and basically it said that it was a you know a degenerative disease it was mainly um, diagnosed in younger children so his was kind of unique in that he was older when we when we finally diagnosed it, and that it was it was fatal. The secret of the messy hairdo, that you gotta like make it look like you didn't do your hair in the morning, you know? That's the secret. Kyle had onset of symptoms at age 18, and he's still able to walk with some assistance. Um, he uses a wheelchair more for, you know, independence and safety and, you know, to get around easier. Um, somebody like Brianne, she had onset at a much earlier age. She required use of a wheelchair by the time she was 18 and now she needs help with all of her activities of daily living, bathing, eating, dressing, and her speech is very affected and so it's very difficult to understand her. And she also has significant loss of vision and hearing at this point. We're recording. We're... All right, you gotta scoot, scoot your head over for a second. All right, here we are. This is Brian. Once again, we are in Truckee at the ski FA Ski Weekend. We're just having a whole lot of fun together. And uh, here's another perspective on FA from Brian. Not so prolific. <laughs> Not so what? What was that word? Well, I can't say it. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> While the neurological aspects of Friedrich's ataxia are easy to see when, when you meet somebody with a the condition, there are other really serious complications of the disease that you can't see. Um, the most serious is heart disease. And the heart in FA is affected in almost everyone, but about a third of people with FA develop a really severe form of heart disease called cardiomyopathy and that cardiomyopathy is present in children and it gets progressively worse and individuals die by the age of 25 to 30 years of age of heart failure. They have a rule at my house, uh, don't tell dad, because uh, I, I didn't handle it well. We were told that Aaron had Friedrich's ataxia um, and that it was not good, it was very rare, and uh, there was no cure. So we needed some time in the doctor's office to pull ourselves together, because Erin was in the waiting room, and uh, we just, she was just a little girl, she was only 12. My wife and I, it was the worst time in our lives. I remember my wife telling me long before I met Kyle that there was this kid that was gonna be on TV that was gonna, he rides a trike, this kid from California. She said his name, I think I saw a clip on the, our local news. Um, it was Kyle. Yeah, Pat and I are always looking for, for inspirational stories and inspirational people, and they're out there. And, and a lot of times we look cross country to find you're in our you're here in our town, and, and you're doing this, and you're taking well, off. So you get on your bike. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Which then I'll is be in young. June, and we want, to, we want to talk about that here in a second. Just real quick, uh, on Saturday, you've got kind of a, a, a local ride, correct? Right, yeah. It's called Ridey Taxi in NorCal. And it starts in Folsom. Um, the main event is a 100-mile bike ride in two days, so it's 50 miles a day. Okay. On the first day, we also have 10 and 25-mile options to kind of span the spectrum of abilities and get anyone who wants to come out and ride to uh, ride with us. Riding my bike translates into getting people excited about what they could do and motivated to raise funds, and we all raise funds together. That fuels the research 
for someone to be able to look into the microscope and know what's going on in there. And then that turns into clinical trials where the patients participate in clinical trials and that pushes a drug further along. And then eventually that those clinical trials will lead to an approval of a drug which will lead to a treatment for people with FA. And holy cow, it all starts with riding a bike. That's pretty cool. Let's start with everybody's name. Okay. okay. Do you want to start? Yeah. Dylan. Helm. I'm Jennifer Helms. Jason Helms. This is Sienna Helms. Dylan has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that was actually diagnosed when he was about four. And at the time, there wasn't, uh, nobody really considered Friedrich's ataxia. They thought that we were just dealing with the heart issue. And um, about a year after that, when things were continuing to get worse as far as the energy level and the, the, the walking and the running, we went back to Seattle Children's Hospital and uh, they ran a whole bunch of tests at that point. Friedrich's ataxia was one thing that they tested for and that was, that was how, how the diagnosis came about. When they told us that that's what it was, I just, all I didn't want to hear was that it was progressive. And, and uh, that's when we started to learn more about it because it was progressive and it is progressive. Once we found out the diagnosis about Dylan, we uh, opted to have Sienna tested, and she also has Friedrich's ataxia. At first, I was just trying to raise money and awareness. When I realized that people were starting to look to me for inspiration, I told myself, you need to do something crazy. You need to do something so undeniably huge that no one would even believe it was possible. 800 miles longer than the Tour de France. Voted the world's toughest event. Through the desert, over the mountains, and across America's heartland. Every year, cyclists from all over the world descend on Oceanside, California to prove themselves in the race across America. Cyclists must traverse 3,000 miles across 12 states and climb over 170,000 vertical feet from Oceanside to Annapolis in nine days. The clock never stops. <laughs> well, um, I guess it's just kind of the, kind of the next step. It's, um... It's another one of those darn ideas of his. You're, you're an idiot, you're crazy. And I really meant it, it wasn't joking. Like, I was like, there's no way you can do that. Kyle and I had talked about putting together this big event, and he started talking to me about Race Across America. And in this initial conversation, it was a matter of he was going to get on a team and he was, he was talking to me because he wanted to know if I would recommend Mike. I said, okay, what's the idea? And he said, it's a race across the United States uh, on our bikes. And I said, okay, how long is this gonna take us? And he said, well, our time limit is nine days. So we have to do it in nine days. And I thought to myself, that's crazy. I reached out to John Lockwood and asked him if he wanted to do this crazy ride in, like always John said, yes. This is gonna be a challenge, uh, bring it on. But with Kyle's enthusiasm, optimism, and, and just go get it attitude, uh, he had me sold immediately. It kind of works nonstop. Somebody always has to pedal. We knew some basics, exactly how it was gonna break down and how much I was gonna do and how much, I, I didn't know. Um, but he assured me that we would have a team that was strong and we would have a support group that uh, was committed. As soon as I heard they were looking for volunteers, I'm saying, well, geez, okay, I don't qualify. You know, all I can do is I can change a flat tire but on a bicycle, but I, I don't know what I could do. But, geez, I'd love to be selected to be on the team. I had no clue what I was getting into. 
teams consist of four riders and a support crew. The whole team will ride 350 to 500 miles per day. The riders are split into teams of two and race in relay format. The riding team consists of two follow vans. While one rider is on the road followed by a support van, the other rider waits ahead to continue the relay. The strategy of who races when and how long depends on the strengths of the team members and the terrain. The riders must ride a set path or face disqualification. The relay teams take shifts, never sleeping for more than four hours. While one team is riding, the other team is resting in an RV and speeding ahead to prepare for the next leg. The support crew handles all of the logistics, food, fluids, navigation, clothing changes, medical needs, and bike repairs, so that the racers can focus on racing. So Mike, after the informational seminar, what do you think about RAM? Mm. Epic. Wow. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> it's, it was a lot. Uh, I'm super pumped and uh, nervous all at the same time. Here we go. You look good, man. Just to make sure. I, I got all the wrinkles out, right? Because I ironed the collar. Nice, nice. Your collar looks magnificent. Thank you. I was pretty fearful just because I hadn't trained as much as the Mikes and Johns. You know, they were, they were ready to go and probably most prepared. I would do 100 mile rides on the weekends. Uh, my goal was to put about 250 to 300 miles a weekend. And I felt if I could do that consistently, I would build up some endurance. Uh, the challenge was at the end of each week, I felt like, okay, I rode 300 miles this week. I'm gonna ride 300 miles in 24 hours for Ram. We're counting down to Ram. What do you think, Sean? I think I should be doing this a lot more than I have been. Yeah. I'm excited, it's gonna be a good race. Yeah, I think it, Really, I think it needs to be the first thing we think about when we wake up. The race? And the last thing we think about when we go to sleep. I think it should be the thing we think about when we're eating, when we're working. I think it feels like it kind of has been for me. Good. Me too. Mostly. You don't want to go into RAM with, I'd say, anything more than the most minor medical problems. Because RAM is hard enough without starting off with a physical disability, but I've always thought that the brain will push you beyond what your body can do. There's been stories of people in, in war and they're basically awake two or three days and you can't do that in real life. Your body's telling you, stop this crap, stop it. And your brain says, keep on doing it. But you gotta be in some kind of physical shape or you won't make it at all. You won't get out of California. But the brain, the brain can overrule to a certain extent, and I don't know where that extent is. You gotta have both. Keep getting little gnats in my mouth. I love it. Here's these two guys. They can't hardly walk in this incredible, the, the hottest race in the world. Everything's easy for us. We, you know, everything we do is easy. When we have FA, nothing's easy. We want the entire world to know about this disease. We want the entire world to know that people are living in the shadows of this disease because it's just not known. And then by finishing, that's all. I expect to accomplish a finish. Mm -hmm. And I think that alone will be significant and great for me personally, and for this team, and for all other FA patients from the globe. Is it safe to say this will be the toughest thing physically you've ever accomplished in your life? Absolutely. Hands down, the toughest thing. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that much, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to have taken away uh, an epic adventure. Uh, pretty much the biggest thing I've ever done in my life. I look at, uh, you know, my, my teammates Kyle and Sean I'm just humbled by, you know, what they face in their lives and the challenges they face and, 
you know, I look at them and they're both, you know, incredible, uh, you know, both mentally and physically. And uh, it, it really helps hold me accountable to what's important in my life and that's, that's my health. This race was an opportunity for me to really be able to focus on my health and to be able to get into the physical shape it's going to take in order to complete this race and to make sure that um, I can positively contribute to the team. Thank you to the team and the crew for letting me be a part of this. And uh, let's do this. Okay, now we have team 426. Team Fire! Racers Kyle, Sean, John, and Mike! Okay, their charity, charity's hard to read. They're raising money for Frederick's Ataxia Research Alliance, F-A-R-A, hence the name, Fara. It is a debilitating, life-shortening, degenerative neuromuscular disorder, and they're raising money to fight that. Thank you. Did you hear about me? Me and what I've done. Wrote a letter to sweet Louise. I confess my love. And I thought that everyone would know by now. I've been alive long enough to know how things just get around. And everybody probably thinks I'm crazy. Well, I'll just tell you now. That I fell in love And I couldn't help myself I just fell in love And I couldn't help myself It was like a movie Watching her eyes read What I wrote made sweet Thank you, kind sir. You're good to go. Mechanic Mike, you the man. All the credit. All right, brother. Are you stoked for this glass elevator or what? Can't wait. You gotta get this smile. Yeah, yeah! <laughs> so as we were planning the, the course and which team was gonna be on the road and which legs, who was gonna start, uh, we started plotting out how the transitions would work and we realized that we were coming up to the glass elevator which is a 4,000 foot descend over a couple short miles. I raised my hand and said, guys, please give me the descent. I'll crush it. I'll tear it up. Give it to me. And uh, although there was some contention around who would, would ride the glass elevator, um, they, they granted that leg to me. And uh, that was awesome because I love descending, I love speed, and it was me against the mountain. I says, John, I want you to take it easy down this hill. It's all downhill, it's like four miles downhill. I says, I want you to take it easy. Go slow, we don't want any accidents, We're, you know, just take it easy. He takes off and he flew, he just flew. As we made the transition at the top of the glass elevator, it was the most epic scene I've experienced in cycling to that point. And that was looking across the desert and being able to see what felt like forever. And as the blue sky melted into the orange and yellowish desert, it was awesome. We were descending at about 42 miles an hour on a pretty narrow, twisty road. 
and uh, I was so full of adrenaline and endorphins, I couldn't break. I just kept going and trying to pedal faster, and I remember distinctly passing our follow car who was in front of us, filming me from the front, past him. There was a car in front of that, and they kept yelling at me, slow down, slow down, but there was no way. I tried to slow down, I wasn't even slowing down. The brakes were not working, so I figured to heck with it. Just keep going. John is somewhere up there. He is hauling butt, and the fellow van is having trouble keeping up with him. So uh, we're picking up some time on this downhill here because John is a crazy animal. I says, John, I says, how fast are you going? He says, I was going 60. I said, well, I thought I asked you to go slow. He says, I was. I wanted to go 70. Sick! That was the best thing I've ever done on a bike. So awesome. Every day I see Dylan fall. Um, every day I see a loss of function. <laughs> But, but there's hope. Yes. That's why we're here. <laughs> what would you guys say to people watching this movie about about FA? What would you like people to hear? That everyone with FA can have a wheelchair. People with FA can't run as fast as people without FA and that we usually fall down and they don't. What can you do though? Um, well, we can race in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And bikes. Yeah. through Monument Valley. I was driving. I think I was following Kyle. I've been dry on your shirt and I've been hung out on the line. We had to stay behind Kyle 24-7 because of his recumbent bike. Somebody said, oh yeah, we're, we're in Monument Valley. I just looked out and never even noticed Monument Valley. just watching Kyle in front of me. But really, you just wait.
my appointment for the explanation of FA was on the third floor of the medical building and I took the elevator up and sat with the geneticist for an hour who explained to me what I was up against. I was there alone, so I was just trying to absorb everything. And when I left, I got back to where the elevator was and of course right next door were stairs. And I pushed the button for the elevator and I was waiting. And it dawned on me, I said, you know, there's stairs right across the way and it's only three floors. And it wasn't so much that I was lazy or anything like that, it was just convenience. I always took the elevator. And it dawned on me at that point that that doctor that I just sat down with for an hour was telling me that a day will come uh, then I may not be able to do that, where I won't have the option, but then I'll be stuck in the elevator, unable to handle the stairs. So without hesitation, I said, I'm taking the stairs. And so I took the stairs down to my car and I sat in my car, trying to figure out what I'm doing and what to do with it. And over the course of a couple of years now, or three years, um, that's evolved into what Kyle mentions is uh, part of what my purpose is. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm doing obviously is for personal challenge. Um, I've been told that I won't be able to do a lot of things in the future. And I'm okay with that when that comes. But there's no reason why I can't do things now. Um, so I'll do everything I possibly can to push the limits, push the envelope, whatever cliche phrases are out there, um, I'm going to grab the bull by the horns and I'm going to show this bull that has picked the wrong body. Give me your victory pose. What? Your victory pose. Awesome. When an individual is diagnosed with FA, it's such a lonely feeling. Most people have never heard the words Friedrich's ataxia. And so personally, when I was diagnosed, it was, it was a really lonely feeling. I felt like me and my family were the only ones who'd ever heard of this disease. Based on the incidence of Friedrich's ataxia, we know that there should be five to 6,000 people living with the disease in the United States. Currently, we're in contact with about 1,200 of them. This means that 80% of individuals living with FA are dealing with this disease alone. Keith had been in the hospital for on and off for six months, mostly on, and uh, with brief intervals of being sent home on increasing levels of medication to keep his heart functioning. And on the final discharge, the young doctor came up to us and gave us the final uh, package of medications that would be intravenously you know, injected. And he said, make sure this is hooked up on the way home. Your son could die on the drive home. At that time when Keith was diagnosed, there was no research. There were no support groups for patients. There was no awareness of Friedrich's ataxia. There was no funding. Ron and Rachel saw this as an opportunity. FARA is the Friedrich's Ataxia Research Alliance. It was the organization that my wife Rachel and I co-founded in 1998, one year after our son Keith was diagnosed. The first FARA symposium, it changed my life and my wife's life, as well as Aaron's life. Um, forever. Just, we had some hope. We walked into the place, three people alone. We sat at a table uh, by ourselves. It seemed like everybody else knew each other. Uh, Aaron and I are not shy people, my wife is. But at the end of that night, Aaron was off mingling with everybody her age there and we, we felt like we were uh, back with family. So from the beginning of the meeting, being alone, sitting together alone, to walking away with friends for life, including Kyle. Um, it, was, it was great. This letter that I just read before this shift was from a family friend who's been 
supporting us through the rides and they weren't even cyclists a couple years ago and now they're out doing centuries and doing all these crazy bike rides because of what we're doing and uh, they just said that it inspires them to push themselves because of what we're doing. And that pushes me even, even further. So, it's a circular process or something where, you know, I push hard, people support me, and that makes me push even harder. Your RV, you guys just passed uh, the time station, I believe. Well, it's hard to imagine how you can be pushing any harder than this. <laughs> it's a I'll good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy! Yeah, boy! I really enjoyed the dance party last night. What I want, you've got Yeah! You're trying to squeeze the brake lever as hard as you possibly can at the same time. You, right. Your glasses are bouncing around in your face and you're just trying not to crash. You know, that's like the biggest fear. And you're going over these separations of the road. It's just bone rattling. So as, as much as it seems like it's not a lot of work, I mean, it just it beats you, it beats you up. So, man, Woo! this is awesome. <laughs> Go. Go get him, baby. Nice clothes, John. All right, Kyle, go get him, buddy. Good times. Oh. Yes, sir. You know, I had a, a wonderful uh, and meaningful conversation with one of our crew members last night, and uh, I learned that his two sons, his only two sons, are both affected with FA. And, uh, myself desiring to be a father and to raise children, uh, it, it really broke my heart to uh, communicate, just to hear, uh, you know, what he's dealing with and what his sons are dealing with. And uh, I think that this disease is all about the heart. And uh, it, I think we're all here because we have tremendous heart and we're here to, to make a difference. And, uh, and that's why I'm here, uh, I'm here to help and uh, I'm here to finish, and I'm here to tell the story. Many people ever do this. Hi, boy, Sean. Good job, Sean. Here we go, kiddo. Stop playing. Right, right Sean. Hi, boy. Good job. I got your 
Go Mike! Woo! Hey guys. Wait to the van. Nice job, bud. Again? Yeah, Sean. Okay, Hit Mike, here's the bike. Oh yeah, sorry man. I'll get it. Yeah, we got it. That would have sucked. Oh my gosh. That's the worst word, I think. You just biked up the Rockies. Are we in the Rockies? <laughs> We're out of them. I'm glad I didn't know that. That's freaking awesome. We summited the highest point. That was us. Right. We got this. I don't know. And also, that was the Continental Divide. And I don't know the elevation. It's high. It's probably like 40,000 feet or something ridiculous. Of course, like, Mount Everest. It's like right up there by Everest. <laughs> so, what we got here? It makes little... your poop green. <laughs> it tastes like crap. I'm pretty sure we were taking too many to start out with. Definitely. <laughs> They're just like uh, extra little supplements that you might not get in foods or foods we'd be eating. Like certain minerals and stuff. He takes a little bit of estrogen in one of his. <laughs> um, no, they're mostly just like Enduralites. Also, some didn't help the muscles recover faster. <laughs> Careful! <laughs> today has reminded us that we're all in this together in a lot of ways um, and it always brings me back to Ron's quote that um, we can all say in unison now together <laughs> acting alone there is very little we can accomplish acting together there is very little we will not accomplish and that was the central theme through every single presentation we heard today the real backbone, the real spine of Farah, is the way we've built the, the patient community. All these patients began uh, like we did in 1997 and 1998 as isolated individuals, not, not even knowing there were you know, 15,000 FA patients like themselves around the world, not knowing that there were 5,000 or so American patients, not knowing that there was at least a handful of scientists devoting themselves to this disorder. So they felt isolated, they felt hopeless, they felt helpless. And so if you fast forward to today, those isolated, hopeless, helpless people are now members of a huge FA family. Uh, they're not hopeless, they're confident. Uh, they're not helpless, they know that what we are all doing together will get us across the finish line. With the, the support we have from Farah and the Farah family and the doctors and uh, Ron Bartek, these dedicated people, and then Kyle comes into the equation, and, um, and who would have thought a guy with, that can't even walk is gonna ride his bicycle across the United States? Go for a vehicle, we're at the uh... Shell station. It's crazy it's how time. you can support uh, the cause just by time station here. Uh, just by right. thinking about time it. Time station 14. Expressing support. Like that's that's just as big as somebody writing a check. We are solving the dark. We fleet six billion strong. There are few heads among us who don't want to go. We're always hungrier, thieving bacteria, 
What's up with that storm that's to the south? Whoa, dude, that was sweet. It's pouring rain and I'm cold, I'm wet. I can barely see because I don't want to put glasses on because I'll just fog up. And the rain's yeah, coming man. down, plus yeah. everything's spraying up from my wheels. Yeah, so it's raining spray. like five times as much as actually coming down and I'm going okay this is miserable but I guarantee there's plenty of people out there who are like all right if we know what if we knew what to do to cure FA we would do whatever it takes we would ride through Indiana at 3 30 a.m. in the pouring rain any day, easily. No question if that's what it took to cure this disease. And so, that I truly believe that's what we're doing out here tonight, is um, working towards a cure. And if this is what it takes, that's a small press to pay. So we'll get it done.
I know we're supposed to be heading east, yeah. but I'm not exactly sure we're going in that direction. I feel like I've just driven around in one big old circle. Well, uh, my GPS here is telling me we're heading directly east. Go straight, straight. Do you see Main Street anymore? Junction at 3, 57 6. So we should be 57 6. Okay, we're five miles up. So we're five miles up. Van 1 to Van 2. Okay. I was just confirming you are at the 60.9 bear right. 46. Now the John the bear right shouldn't come up for another two 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 and a half miles. We're still three miles away from that. You're really breaking up a lot, but yeah, it's sort of like that earlier in the middle. Copy that, I'm just killing this kid. He's he's at like eight miles already. And that just lit up. How far past the corner at 60.9 are you? Can you head back towards us just to you know try to try to knock a mile or two off of this form? We're already at eight miles. Are you at the 60.9 bear right SR46? You're at the time, so we're taking this all the way to the time station? Oh, that's a... Yeah, we... No, we're... Well, we, we thought that's what we were going to do. I know, but I think uh, he thought we were much closer than we are. This is almost a 13-mile pull this kid's doing right now. I, I almost think he had... I, I don't know. Let me go ask him. There. Sean, can you handle three more miles? What? Can you handle three more miles? Fuck no, my RV no. should be right here. Yeah, you guys need to come back now. All right, yeah, I'm gonna drive her right now. Well, I'll let you know when we're headed back. All right, man, Jenna man one, you copy? Yes. It's on the right hand side. Station. It's coming up a little less than a mile. Shell gas station on the right. Phil's gonna be out there. You said less than a mile at gas station? Yeah, Shell. Just about a mile. It is. Well, Just don't let it happen again. Right, that right. hurt. Keep doing it. Roll it. Rip it. Roll it. So. I think there are a hundred reasons today while I'm doing RAM. And One of your earlier questions was, 
What have you gone through to get ready for this? <laughs> Three months ago, my father passed away. I emailed him and my mom when this came up. I said, this is what we're thinking about. What do you think? And I later found out that my dad was so excited about the way I was facing the challenges in my life and so excited about the opportunity to be a part of this team and to race across America that he went online to see how he can be involved in. He found a category that he could race in. It was just him for fun. Obviously, he was dealing with cancer. He wouldn't... He was in no position to do it, and he knew that, but the idea of it was so cool to him. And once he found out that I committed to doing it, he told everybody in his world. Everybody knew that Jack's son was going to do this. And I know he was proud just to watch. And so another the reason why I'm writing today is to make sure that dream becomes a, re a reality, whether he's physically there to witness it or not. I know that I'm making him proud. And to me, that's incredibly important and incredibly motivating. That was a long answer. <laughs> I got a little pain in my right hip right now because I'm getting old. Well, I walk upon the river like at sea, sea, earth, and land. And it bothers me when I sit like this, and I'm going to be funny when I stand up for a little while. Man, I got no problems compared with a whole bunch of other people. And I got a little hearing problem, but I can hear. I got I got to wear glasses, and they got bifocals, but I can see. Man, they're blind people that ride bikes. I think I've ever been this hot in my life. Every engine is burning. Now spikes will keep them falling from the heavens to the floor. Future was our skin and now we don't dream anymore. No, we don't dream anymore. Oh, oh, oh. thought that we should be freaking riding the bikes across the country to like disabled dudes. Like, that's nuts, man. You're definitely more disabled than me. <laughs> I just, I just want to point Thank you. Out. Thank you. <laughs> Day five, right, guys? Something like that. Something like that. No one even knows what day it is. So... But uh, we're still having a good time. Kyle's got everybody buying trikes. Aaron bought a trike. We've been walking in the pool all winter. Uh, just try to get her legs strong so that when we find this cure, she's going to walk again. She told me in the pool, we, were, we're, we made it to about three quarters of a mile in the lap pool walking with my assistance. And she told me when she, um, when she, we made a mile, she was going to post that she walked a mile in her own shoes. And I'm like, uh, yeah, let's do it today. Come on. Let's do it now.
somewhere around here so we figured what the heck hey, let's just come down here and see if we can find them. riding bikes and decided to come over. I was so glad. We were just here hanging out alongside the road. <laughs> Seeing who might come in. Good deal. Kyle, this is Jack. Jack, what's up, man? Hey, Kyle. Nice <laughs> to meet you. I got a train just like this. Yeah? Yep. Sweet. Hey, buddy. I'm Bob O'Neill from Boston. <laughs> nice to see you. Thanks for coming up to see us. Jack from Michigan. During the last couple of weeks of Keith's life in the hospital and at home, he, he had lost a lot of his ability to verbally communicate. Um, he could still work the keyboard somewhat, uh, so he could type out uh, messages. But then he started having me type messages to his friends in his name, and his uh, speech was almost in, you know, incoherent. You had to put your ear right next to his lips, and you had to know his speech and his speech patterns to make out anything. Uh, so communication was largely nonverbal and, and very tender and loving and brave. He died very graciously. Having said marvelously warm and loving things to each of us individually. He was a fine young man. I was pissed at first. I was just pissed. I, when I would go to church, I used to scream and say, Give it to me. Switch places. If you. Do this little miracle, then I will do everything. Give it to me. I've done everything I need to do. Now when I go in, I'll, I'll talk. I'll just like, okay, come on. It's just a little miracle. You can do it. There are a lot of people in this world that deal with um, challenges. There are um, a lot of people who live a life jeopardized by some sort of disease or something unfortunate that they never asked for and there's nothing they could do to change it and there's something inside me that says no matter what the issue or concern or disease or dysfunction is there's a way to fight it 
and there's always hope. Uh, so for me, it's a way to remind myself that there's hope for me, there's hope for Kyle, and 10,000 or so other FA patients in the U.S., and there's hope for people that deal with all kinds of disease. Um, I think what we're doing, and on the open road, and in such a challenge, there's that really is where life is meant to be lived. And so I'm doing it because I think that's where life is most lived. Dylan, do you remember what it's like before you had a wheelchair? I'll show you. Sing songs. The 
Too 